Okay, let's start. Today, um, I'm going to talk um, about health issues um, in Africa. Um, at the end of this um, talk, um, you'll be able to identify health-related um, Millennium Development Goals, what it means, and understand the global crisis of health workforce in, um, in Africa. And then you, you will be able to recognize factors that contribute um, to the health crisis in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to start with um, showing you what, um, you know, this is a nice picture of what the um, eight um, Millennium Development Goal is. And you can see we have eight there. Um, the first one is um, to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. How many people know, how many people know a bit about uh, the Millennium Development Goal? That's good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. The second one is to achieve universal primary education. The third is to promote gender equality and empower women. And the fourth, to reduce child um, mortality. Fifth, to improve maternal health. Six, to combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Seven, to ensure environmental sustainability. And the last one is uh, for global partnership for development. Yeah, um, the United Nations uh, Millennium Development um, Goals, we have eight of it, and this was put together by the United um, Nations Member States. We have um, 195, no, 193 uh, members. Uh, most countries in the world are part of this. So they put this together, and they all agreed uh, to put this goal together, and this goal to be achieved in 2015. So this goal, the deadline is next year. So we only have less than a year to see if all the goals they put together, if they'll be able to um, achieve it. And this is a declaration signed in 2000. Um, it's a commitment by all, um, all the UN members to really combat, um, combat um, poverty, hunger, disease, illiteracy, environmental and Degradation and discrimination against women. So they put this together, and each um, of these goals are set for 2015, which is next year. And all it does is to monitor the progress, the health, the progress of this using the 1990 um, level of indicators. Yeah, these are the goals. Three of um, the eight um, Millennium Development Goals are health related. And these are the three. The, uh, goal four, you know, as I said, reduce mat um, childhood maternity. Goal five, improve maternal health. Goal six, to combat HIV, um, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And the other goals, they, you know, they, they are monitored through health-related um, indicators. They're not really health-related, but the, the um, indicators that is used to monitor or assess them are through um, uh, health-related. So to eradicate poverty and hunger and to ensure environmental sustainability. And the last one is the partnership one. These are the two Millennium uh, Development Goals that are not health-related but as important as the health-related ones. The first one is to achieve primary um, universal education and the gender equality. So you can see the breakdown. I try to explain the breakdown to see where I'm coming from. And so far, um, I'll just briefly tell you, um, tell you what's going on. With the assessment done maybe a year ago to see what's going on and, oh, and to see uh, what we'll, we'll, we'll be seeing next year regarding the, um, the progress that's been done or how many of the goals have been achieved. Um, while some countries have you know, had very impressive gains um, in achieving these goals, um, others are falling behind. And the, the, the progress is really uneven. Um, the, the report um, shows uh, a, bit of, a lot of disparities between countries. And even within countries, you still see disparities as well. For example, there's a disparity between the low-income countries and the high-income countries. Then there's disparity between the African region versus the rest of the um, United um, World Health um, regions as well. And then you see within country, you see there's a difference between rural and urban. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that um, later on. 
often countries uh, making the least progress because of this dispar disparity. Why are we having this disparity? The, most of the countries that you see that are not making the most progress, you will see they have a very high level of HIV AIDS because that takes a toll on, on any country that have to deal with HIV AIDS. They have a very high, um, they have some economic hardship. It could be war, it could be, you know, uh, uh, economic hardship due to war or unemployment or things like that. There's a conflict, it's a, usually a conflict area, very unstable um, government. Corruption is another thing. You'll see that most of the ones that are, not, that are not doing well, there's a lot of corruption in that country. Violence, and, and a country where even though they may have democracy, but people just do what, whatever they want to do, and not really following the, 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 the rule of law in those countries. Yeah, let's, let's have some statistics uh, regarding um, global health uh, workforce. My, my talk is going to be really a lot about the workforce in, 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 in Africa and why, why, why do we have um, uh, health care that is still behind compared to the rest of the, country, um, the, rest of the world. Globally, um, we, are sh we have a shortfall of about 4.3 million health workers globally. That we need about 4.3 million health workers to at least be able to have enough, not just adequate number of people to take care of, you know, the sick and, and people that need care. And we've, we found that education and training is insufficient. We don't, we don't have enough training um, schools, we don't have enough people to train, um, and that's the problem. And then you find out that most of the healthcare workers, there's a real difference in what they're paid from country to country. Some of them will get less than $100 in some countries, for example, some doctors. On the other hand, you have some that will get more than 14000 You have countries, and some countries in, in, in the low-income um, in the low income countries, they will be maybe giving their, maybe um, paying their doctors like $200, equivalent of $200 or $300, which is, you know, how can anyone live from that? And after being in uh, medical school for all those years and being paid less than $500 a month. And then let's go to Sub Saharan Africa. As we know, 24% of um, the global burden of disease we see in um, Sub Saharan Africa. Um, we know there's a lot of problems with HIV/AIDS, with infectious diseases. With now, with chronic diseases, it goes on and on. And usually, when we talk of Africa, most people, when they think of Africa, they think of disease and death and things like that. So you know, um, that's the reason because they carry at least uh, a quarter of the body of diseases um, in the world, and they only have three percent of the world's um, health workers. So you can see the. Um, the disbalance when they only have three percent who takes care of all those sick people and that's why you have a very very high mortality rate and a very very high morbidity end rate in, in Africa because even when people are sick it's like that they, they can't get to where they need to be taken care of or they don't even have people to take care of them and then one of four doctors or one of 20 doctors trained in Africa are working in developed countries we're going to talk about that later on that's another issue that you know, after they trained in their country, they still leave their country to go and serve in other country. And this is a country that doesn't even have enough in the first place to take care of them, the own people. <coughs> yeah, now I'm gonna talk about you know the critical human resource for health shortage. And, and when we're talking about that, we're talking about doctors and lawyers and pharmacists and psychiatrists, anyone that works in the health um, um, sector. Uh, you can see there's an uneven distribution of health workers within um, most of um, the countries we'll be talking about. For example, the minimum threshold of every country, it should be about 23. 23 um, health care workers for 100,000 um, people in the population. But in, Af in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, it's 6.4. So 23 to 6.4, you can see it's really highly inadequate. And then there's a difference even in urban, urban settings. You will find out that most of the healthcare professionals live in the urban, you know, prefers to stay in the urban um, area. And then instead of staying in rural areas. And the reason, the reason you see that is most urban areas, that's where you get the good jobs, 
that's where it's more comfortable. You know, if people end up getting married, they want to have their children in good schools. Most of the rural um, area in, in, in Africa, it's the only thing they can do is farming. And as you know, farming, agriculture is not like a big thing now because everybody is moving to the urban area. So much is not really happening in the, in the rural area. And most rural and most African countries are predominantly rural. And I will talk about Tanzania and I'll talk about Nigeria later on. And we talk about um, rural versus urban. Yeah, Africa has the greatest body of disease for the least um, healthcare um, workforce. Of, of, the seven, of the 57 um, countries you know, which have been identified to have crises of healthcare workers, 39 of those in the world are in Africa. 39 of those countries are in Africa, and then 36 are in Sub-Sahara Africa. And as you know, I don't know if everybody knows, um, when we're talking of Africa, um, is different from Sub-Sahara Africa. Does anybody know the difference between Africa and Sub-Sahara Africa? Really? <laughs> oh, I thought everybody knows that. <laughs> I'm African, maybe that's what I thought. I just assume. Yes. Africa is the whole of Africa, uh, but Sub-Sahara Africa is the, you take off, um, Sub-Sahara Africa is everything Africa except um, Algeria, Liberia, no, uh, Libya, Egypt, I think they're about, yeah, Tunisia, the northern part, northern part, because they are, oh, because of the Arab um, influence, most of the people that come from that area, they don't really call themselves African, they call themselves Arabs. So when you talk of Africa, um, usually it's sub-Sahara Africa, because most of the things it was down after that region. So um, at the current rate of elf, um, elf worker production in these countries, the deficit will never meet, uh, 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 the deficit can never be met and only can, can grow at the rate we're going. Because if we're not having more people to be trained, we don't have um, enough um, institutions to train them, and we continue to have sicker and sicker population, how can we meet, um, you know, meet the goals and be able to really take care of people? So today I'm going to focus on two countries in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to focus on Nigeria. The reason why I decided to pick Nigeria, you know, I did realize that Dr. Buber did talk about Nigeria a bit, but I'm going to talk about something else, so I'm not going to really bore you. Um, and the reason I chose Nigeria is because Nigeria is the largest country in Africa. I think we're about going to about 150 million now, and they're predicting that Nigeria will double Nigeria will double in the next few decades. That Nigeria will have the most growth in the world by 1950, and, and, to, and 2050. That's going to double um, what we see today. It's going to surpass India, it's going to surpass China, it's going to surpass the United States. That's the, and they said that's where the most, um, uh, and in Africa, that's where they're going to have the, the most middle class in the next 20, 30, 40 years. So there's a lot of potential in Africa. As negative as you know, so many things going on there, that's where the next move is going to be because there's um, going to be millions and millions of people. So they're predicting that Africa will double to about <coughs> 3 billion, because about 1.1 billion now, and it's going to be the most um, um, populated um, part of the world in the next few decades. So that's an issue when we're talking about um, health issues, and we're still having all these um, crises. I just want to show you the um, the map of Africa. Yeah, as I was saying, um, Sub-Sahara Africa is above here. So all these countries here, up here, that you know, they're not part of Sub-Sahara Africa. Countries from Mali, Niger, Chad, and Sudan down here, Sub-Sahara, but. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, like, um, Libya, and Egypt are all um, Arab, you know, they count themselves as Arab. The reason I'm showing this is um, for two reasons. This is, I'm going to talk about Nigeria. This is why, where Nigeria is, where the western part of the continent, and this is where Tanzania is, the eastern part of the continent. 
And eventually, when I'm going to just mention briefly about what's going on regarding Ebola, these are the three countries next to each other. Um, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. These three countries. That's where. So when we're talking of Ebola, when most people say Ebola in Africa, no, Ebola is not in Africa. Ebola is in three countries. Because Africa is not a country. <laughs> Africa is a continent. Most Americans don't realize that Africa is a continent. So when you're talking Ebola, in, you have to say Ebola in Syria alone, Ebola in Guinea, and Ebola in Liberia, not Ebola in Africa. If you say Ebola in Africa, that means Ebola is all over Africa. Uh-uh. <laughs> so that's one thing I, that's why I brought my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now um, I just want to give you a little quick um, um, demographics about Nigeria. As I say, it's about 150 million now. A lot of people. That's a lot of people, and the life expectancy is only 54, 54 years old, um, 54 years. And then Tanzania, the population is only 42 million, and the life expectancy is 61. In the United States, the, just to give you um, something to compare. The United States um, life expectancy is like um, 79, I think it's 79 now. So compare that, that's major. So uh, an average African will die 20 years before an average American. That's like a whole, like a whole um, um, lifetime. Yeah, this is a very important um, table. Um, what I've done here is um, put together some very important um, um, millennium, millennium Development Goals that are related to health and their indicators. What I did was I put Nigeria and Tanzania next to each other, and I put the United States, even though the United States is not part of you know, um, the Millennium Development Goal that they have to achieve, I just want to give you an idea, the numbers we have here in the US compared to the other parts, so to, to see how far away um, those countries and their indicators are. So you can see that um, the, the first one is the, um, the goal for, which is the uh, Millennium Development Goal, about infant mortality. Um, Nigeria has about 78 um, per, 78 per 100, uh, what, per 1,000 live birth, and Tanzania has 38, whereas the United States has six. Even the six that the United States are is still not very good, because countries like, um, uh, you know, um, most of the Scandinavian countries and and some few of the Asian countries are where we're doing much more. They're doing much much better than the United States for the standard and the amount of um, money we spend on healthcare in the United States. For that number six, the United States not doing well at all. That's a disgrace. We're supposed to be zero or one. Yeah. So, but still, you can see the difference between that and, and the other um, sub-Saharan um, African countries. And then the under five mortality, the children that die before age five, it's 124, um, and then for Tanzania, 54, and the United States, seven. That's another problem. Um, in the United States, the problem we see in the United States, that should, this number should be zero. But in the United States, because we have health disparity in, in, in the United States as well, so we have a, a segment of the population of the United States that are not really doing well at all. They're really doing well, hopefully, similar to what we see in the sub-Saharan Africa, here in the United States. So when you look at the overall um, number for the United States, it doesn't really look good, because we have to find the average. You're not just going to present the ones the people doing well in the United States. You have to add everybody together. So that's why you see those numbers. And then let's go um, to um, Millennium Gold 5. That's the maternal mortality. That's very, very high. These are the numbers of mothers that die after childbirth. They die during childbirth or you know, just after childbirth. And you can see that Nigeria has 560 and Tanzania has 410, and the United States has 28. And when I was looking at this yesterday, I even saw that the numbers for last year increased. No, the, the number for 2012 went up for the United States. That's a very bad sign that we are even getting worse, even though it was just for one, but that's not good. Yeah, we're not talking about the United States now, but I just have to put that in, sorry. <laughs> so, because I teach health disparities, so I can't help myself. 
Yes. The next, um, the next one is um, the birth the birth at attended by skilled um, health um, personnel. So when mothers are ready to have a baby or during the time they're pregnant, who takes care of them? Um, you know, where, where do they go for their antenatal things? Do they have care during um, pregnancy? And when it's time for them to have the baby, do they have someone to help them, uh, assist, assist them to have the baby? For um, Nigeria, it's only 38% of, of women really have um, you know, trained personnel to be there with them to have a baby. And that's really, um, that's very, very low. And that's why you see the very high, um, you, you see, you know, lots of mothers die because um, during and childbirth, um, if they don't have help and they have complications, most of them either bleed to death or maybe bleed to death after childbirth and they die. And then you can see Tanzania, 49, and the United States, 99. Then we go to the um, to the goal six, which is HIV AIDS. Um, Nigeria is 149, um, Tanzania 167, and then the pop and then you go to the um, the last one, the number of people with drinking water. You know, not a bit better for Nigeria, but um, not not totally um, you know, not totally good. So what this is telling us is that. You see that Nigeria is larger than Tanzania, you know, so many times more than Tanzania. Nigeria is not doing well at all. And the fact that it's a, it's a, it's a larger country, there are more people who are in, in this kind of situation. And the sad thing about Nigeria is, Nigeria is, um, is supposed to be um, the richest country in Africa. Yeah, and they are the richest country in Africa, except the riches is not safe. It's a country that is the richest country in Africa, but 95% of Nigerians still live below poverty level. And that's the reason. And the reason is, you know, we'll talk about that later on. I think Dr. Guba did mention that. So um, the next one is the health system. We want to see how many, you know, how many um, doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals that people, um, you know, people have access to, because that's very important. Um, you can see that Nigeria is 4.1 and Tanzania is 0 0.1. Um, for nurses, it's about 16.1. That means you know they have you know more um, nurses than physicians, and things like dentistry or farm, uh, uh, pharmacies or psychiatrists, they barely have any for, for the population. And this is per um, 10,000 and 10. Thousand and population, and then we look at hospitals. There was no data for Nigeria um, regarding hospital beds, and for Tanzania, you might have seven um, <coughs> seven beds per um, 10,000. 10, I remember when we were in Tanzania, we went to a, um, a, uh, a maternity home, like a maternity hospital. We saw women just having their baby. Few hours after, after having their baby, they have mattresses on the sides of the bed, of another woman's bed, and that's where they're sleeping with their newborn babies. And we saw mothers, two mothers sleeping on the same bed with their babies. One woman would put their head on this side, and the other one would put their head on that side. That's how bad it, it is, because there's less enough beds or hospitals in those places. I need to show you this, give me one second. Yes. Okay, I want to click this. I did earlier on. It disappeared. Okay, it's coming. Okay. Yeah. I think I did give a, did anybody see this? I think we sent it to you guys. Okay, if you don't see, this is an idea of um, the 49 priority countries in the world, you know, the countries that we have the least um, access to healthcare professionals. And you see that line is the threshold, that 23 no, uh, number of threshold. You will see that most of the um, sub, uh, most of these countries are below the tre um, threshold. Nigeria is about 20 at that very end, and Tanzania is down there, um, here. Yeah, can you see? There's barely any uh, anybody to take care of anyone there, and Nigeria is like up there. So Nigeria is up there, but they're still not. You know, they still haven't um, got to where they need to be. Okay, 
Okay, and the, the, and the inequal distribution of healthcare professional is a major, major problem in Africa. And that's why we see the very, very high rates of, of deaths. We see a very, very high rate of sickness, mortality, and morbidity. Because when people are sick, they truly don't have people to take care of them. And people don't even go to, to see healthcare professionals because they don't exist. When they don't exist, even in Africa till today, only 30% of Africans have access to Western medicine. 70% 70, 70 of Africans today still use traditional medicine. So you, st you still have people in Africa that they haven't really, really seen a doctor in the last 20 years or never in their life. If they live in rural, you know, in rural um, parts of their country. And then those people, um, when, when, when they get sick, when they can't take care of just the basic things, or maybe their traditional med medicine can't take care of the basic things, like when they have cancer, you need to do surgery, you need to do all that. They really don't have access to that. And then you see that most of them end up dying. That's why you see that um, life expectancy in those two countries are very, very low. Because basic things that we take for granted here, that we see a doctor, they take care of you, it doesn't have to be something serious. It becomes serious and people die. So people die very, very early. And they die 20 years before the time they're supposed to die. That's what they call premature um, death. And then the stagnant production um, of healthcare pro um, um, providers seen for the past, 20, for the past te 10 years is another issue. For example, 10, 10 years ago was when Nigeria's really produced um, healthcare providers um, and they just got stagnant. They haven't, provide, they haven't provided or trained more people since then. It's just all the numbers is the same. And the reason is because most of those schools, are, the quality of the schools are not that great anymore. Most of people who are supposed to be lecturers and trainers, most of them are out of the country. They're either in, in the European countries or the United States. So with all of this, when we're talking about the Millennium Development Goal, how can we achieve that? You know, how can anybody achieve that with no um, healthcare providers? People are getting sick, so it's a really great and, and a lot of challenge. And that's why it's been very, very slow in Africa, and especially the low-income um, countries that they, they are the very challenging for them to be able to achieve those goals. They truly want to achieve the goals, but it's very, very good possible. So you know, they're trying, and they need funding as well to be able to do that. So and there's this, um, this word that says in worldwide, this guy said, um, it's a quote from, from the former chair of the CHWA, he said worldwide one billion people never see health worker all their life. You know, and that's what I've just said. Because in Africa, if you have 70% of the population, and Africa is 1.1 billion, 1.1 billion and 70% of 1.1 billion um, Africans have never really had access to um, Western medicine. That's a lot of people. Um, so now let's talk about um, the education system because the education system has a, a major impact on um, healthcare um, um, workers. How, how can we train healthcare workers when maybe they haven't even been able to go to finish high school. Because to be able to be a healthcare worker, no matter what, even if it's just a community health worker, you should be able to at least finish high school, be able to read and write, you know, basic things. What you see in most of this country, um, they're really trying in Nigeria. I can't remember what the literacy um, percentage is, but even within the country, most of this country, you will still see a lot of disparity. There are some regions that are doing very well, and you see other regions not doing very great. In Nigeria, you see sometimes the southern um, part of the country may be doing well in certain things, and the northern part of the country may not be doing well because most of this part of the country has been neglected for a long time. And because of the neglect, they're not doing well. So the first thing is the education system in Nigeria um, you know, um, education, you see a lot of people go to school, they, they do the elementary school and go to college and, and all that. But the problem with Nigeria is, at the end of the day, you have all the masses of young people go to school, but there's no job. You've seen people in Nigeria that have graduated from college for three, four, five years and still not, don't have jobs. They're still living with their parents. So that's a problem that people are just not getting jobs. 
So you, that's number one. The rest of the problem is when they're able to get out of the country, they don't come back. So that's Nigeria. But Tanzania, they have a different system. Even though um, Tanzania is, will be able to achieve the Millennium Goal, which is a Millennium Two, that every everybody has to have a, prime, a, a universal education, they're able to do that um, in, in Tanzania. Every child in, in Tanzania uh, goes to school. But guess what? Uh, the education system in Tanzania is like a pyramid. When everybody goes to school, they learn schooling in Swahili till age 10. So after age 10, they switch them to English. And the year after they switch them to English, they do this big entrance that you have to go to high, um, to high school. And then about 60% of children fail that. And when you fail, you just go back home. Either you go back home to get married, or go back home to be found. Or just hang around in big urban centers and with no job. So in Tanzania, you will see that about 70% unemployment. Most people, they barely have any education, maybe just like um, went to school till age 10 or 11, fail that entrance exam, and that's, that's the end of their schooling. So with that problem, there are very, very few people that get to the very top to become trained nurses and doctors and pharmacists. Very, very few, because it's like a pyramid. They keep on dropping. So most people, because they've taught Swahili for, they've learned Swahili for about 10, 11 years of their life, and suddenly now they're teaching them in English. A lot of people fail schools. They're not able to get to college because of the struggle of being able to go to school in English. So at the end of the day, there are a very, very small percentage of people that end up are able to go to school to be nurses and doctors. So they have a very high shortage, a very high shortage of healthcare providers in, in Tanzania because of that. Because there isn't enough people to even get to that level to be educated. And I'm not. This is a problem we see in all of Africa, and it's even very, very rampant in Nigeria as well. Um, more than 23% of, uh, of American um, physicians receive their medical um, degree outside the United States, and that we include people from India, from Asia, from Africa, from all of that. And majority, about 64%, from low-income or low-middle-income countries. And I did talk about that earlier. What's the point of going to medical school for all of those years and not being paid? How can you go to medical school for 10 years and all that? And you know, maybe you're lucky in your country, it's not as expensive as it is in the United States. But to be a doctor, you need to at least to be able to feed your family. How can a doctor not even have a car? Or a doctor can't even take care of his um, family? And that's what you see in most of those low income um, um, countries. They're not really paid. They're not. They're barely paid, and, and well, some of them want to become become very good doctors. Most of the facilities are not well. You know, they're not up to standard to even treat. So they will be there trying to treat their patient, and their patient is just dying in front of them because they don't have equipment, they don't have, uh, med uh, they don't have medication, they don't have all of that. So at the end of the day, they really can't be good doctors. So what they really went to medical school to do, they can't really achieve it. So you see lots of people leave the country. And a total of five, over 5,000, and this number I'm sure would have at least doubled because this is a number for 2006. This is about 10 years ago. So this number will be doubled um, by now. And uh, a total of more than um, 5,000 um, come from sub-Saharan Africa. And they represent about 6%. Um, percent. And nearly 86% of, um, of, the, of these Africans um, you know, practicing in the US originated from three main um, countries, Nigeria, South Africa, and Ghana. So one of the problems you see in a country that we have 153 million, and the few doctors that have been trained in Nigeria are coming to the US, working in UPMC, working in Buffalo and everything. And the people really are dying because they don't have healthcare providers to take care of them. So, and, in, in, and most of these people come from only 10 medical schools. In the whole country, they only have like 10 medical schools. So even some people, who, some people have to leave the country to come to medical schools abroad. So there isn't even enough medical schools for the people who want to study. So that's part of the, there's no enough institution to train them. 
So the solution I see is that there's, there's evidence-based intervention um, because when we're talking about how do we solve, because we, we're talking, always talking about problems and problems in Africa, when we talk about Africa, it's all doom and doom. Yeah, it, it, seems, that, it seems as if um, that's how the situation is, and it, that's the reality. Even though that continent has a lot of potential, but there's a lot of things that's really bringing the continent down. Um, I'll talk about that later on, but what, um, what we have, it, just to make sure that I'm not going fast. Okay, there are more than enough evidence-based programs that have indicated that in a situation like that, we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough healthcare providers to take care of people, and we have sick people. Then what do we do? Do we just leave people to die? No, we can't do that. And programs are out there, and they're evidence-based that we can use healthcare workers, like community healthcare workers. They're not doctors, they're not nurses, the people from the community that are trained on basic things. They can take care of uh, mothers, they can take care of uh, children who have diarrhea, you know, just like really basic things. And if they can't deal with things like that, that's when you have to go to the hospitals. And they're really well-trained people, but these are people in the community, they're trusted, and they really have a stake in their community, and they really do a good job. And research have shown in Asia, in India, in uh, you know, uh, Asian countries like India and, and, and China that uh, it's really worked well and it has really brought uh, like things like mortality rates down for children, for adults. Because when you have people like that in those communities knocking from door to door, helping w women, helping mothers and um, uh, mothers with children, helping um, older adults and everything, you see that their health, their well-being is much better than not having anything. And then there has to be a collaboration among academic institutions and from rich resource um, areas and poor countries. Because if we really, there's so many things, if we really want to help the continent, and we don't, we don't need to keep on giving them aids on this and aids on that, because half of the time, most of these aids we give, uh, uh, most of the low income communities, guess what? It's getting to the pockets of the very few, uh, few Tanzanians and a few Nigerians up there. And these people are very, very rich. In Nigeria last year, Nigeria um, was a country that um, they ordered the most um, private jets in the world. And Nigeria doesn't even have a private, doesn't even have an airline because the airline is bankrupt. They run, they run the, the airline. We don't even have a Nigerian airways. We have to go British Airways and Delta and all that. They're making millions. Imagine 150 million Nigerians traveling like crazy back and forth all over the world and places where they're supposed to be and places they're not supposed to be. They're making a lot of money on 150 million Nigerians going back and Nigeria doesn't even have an airline. But Nigeria, in Nigeria we have the, they ordered the most um, um, private jet in Nigeria last year. Because all of those rich people, all the aids that are given by the West is going into private pockets. And they're getting rich and they're looking good. So the way, the way that we can help most of this country is collaborating with institutions. They're collaborating with institutions here in the United States and those institutions back, back in those countries where to like train train people there, bring them for internship here, and give them incentive <coughs> so that they'll be able to go back there. You know, they can do inter in, in, in some international work for uh, force policy and policies on how to fairly pay those people when they finish their training. Because you don't want to uh, train them that they're well trained, come for internship here, or do a bit of residency here, and then go back and still get the really small amount of money that they can survive. They will end up wanting to stay here. So you have to, have to be national and um, collaborate with national and international medical um, association. Um, most, of the money has, most of the money has to be, um, you have to really um, invest in, 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 in most of those institutions directly, not through you know, third party or whatever. Before it gets to where it's supposed to get to, it's already gone. So these are all the things um, that we can do, and the health system has to be strengthened as well. But how can you strengthen the health system when you don't even have anybody to take care of the patients? So you need to be able to train healthcare providers, whatever health healthcare providers you can train. Even if you can't train doctors, at least you can train community health workers. That will work as well. So that's, um, that will be part of the solution. Um, does anybody have um, any questions?
as we know, um, the Ebola, the session talk about uh, Ebola. I'm not an expert in infectious diseases, so I can't talk more much about you know the real detail about Ebola. But as you know, you know everything you want to know about Ebola, you can go on CDC. It's whatever you know is what I know because we're all going to the same source. But the only thing I really want uh, to bring out that relates to everything I've said in a society where they don't have a good infrastructure, they don't have good hospitals, they don't have enough doctors, when something little happens, it becomes a big thing. For example, in those three countries that we talked about, there, yeah. Yeah. In those three countries we talked about, in the first place, this is like um, Syria alone and Liberia, they are conflict areas. There's been war for years and years in those areas. They don't have good hospitals. They don't have um, health care providers. So when Ebola got there, there was really nowhere to go. And the very, very few, the very, very few um, nurses and doctors that tried to take care of people, <coughs> most of them ended up dying because they didn't even have enough training and enough protocol and they didn't really know what was going on. So the very few healthcare providers that those countries have initially were wiped out because of the spread of the disease. And then, you, these are countries that they're, they're really traditional uh, uh, countries. For example, when people die in those societies, they, there's, a, there's also always, always a ritual. There's a ritual for, for, for burial. You have to carry your dead, and you have to bathe them, and before you, um, you know, you bury them. And for someone that has Ebola, as you know, these people really didn't know what was going on. They carry the person that dies at home or dies at the hospital, take the person home, bathe the person. So everybody that came in touch, the whole family, as a whole family that came in touch with the dead body, everybody ended up dying because they didn't know. And it took a long time before they could even realize what was going on, that you know, this is a disease that even if you touch, you know, especially after death, you will end up having the disease. And then when you start having the disease, and as you know, it's a, a disease that you have diarrhea and, 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 vom you know, and you have, um, vomiting and all that, and within a few hours, if you don't have a drip or keep on hydrating the person immediately, within a few hours, the person will die. In a country that they don't even have drips, they don't have hospitals. So people are having diarrhea at home, they just die at home. And anybody that takes care of all those people die. So in, in most of those countries, you see that a whole family was like wiped out. A whole family will be wiped out just by one person having it. So the bottom line is, the reason why you see Ebola spread that much and, they, and a lot of death happening is because they don't have infrastructure. They don't have enough um, health care providers. They don't have uh, the facilities to take care of things like that. They don't, you see how difficult, how difficult it is for the United States to take care of one person that has Ebola. And everybody was running health as carefully. Just one person. In the United States, we only had one person that ended up having uh, you know, uh, and you know, the first one we couldn't even take care of that. The first person ended ended up um, we ended up um, losing the person. So those are the kinds of things that we see that if we don't have the infrastructure uh, in place, and when people are sick, people will tend to die. And 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 really, until Africa starts to help itself, the help has to come from within. We have to take care of our business and stop waiting for people to take, care of our, to take care of our business. And at the end of the day, until Africans really rebel against the kind of governance that's been given to them. Because until Africans, you know, there's a revolution and say we've had enough. And this is not the kind of life we want to live. And they fight against the government and say this is not what we want. Even in the place that we say democracy, there's so much corruption that the people that want to be there are the people that are there, not the people that you elect. And those are the issues we have in Africa. So if we're talking about health, we have to talk about the, so, um, the, um, you know, the, the society. We need a civil society. Because if we don't have a civil society, we, we will not be able to take off care of all the health issues we have in Africa. And, we, and the, the, the scary thing about Africa is because Africa is multiplying. And the forecast is that Africa is going to double by 2050. So we have 1.1 million Africans now. It may double to 2.1. 2.2 2 
uh, billion. And then if we still continue in this, in this path, half of the people that are being born will still be dead. And then it's going to even get worse because there will be more congestion, there will be, uh, there'll be less work to do and all of that. So we have to find a way as Africans to find a way um, to really solve the problem because without solving the problem, we can't solve the problem of health in, in Africa. And, and there's a and there's way that we can solve it. And the moment we begin to have uh, good governance in all of these countries, Africa will turn around because it's, it, it has potential. I know Africa has potential. And people know that it has potential. And that's why they just can't leave. That's why people can't leave Africa. Because if, they, it has it, if Africa doesn't have potential, they would have beaten Africa up so many long time ago. They keep on going back because they know the amount of potential you have on that continent. But the saddest thing is the people who live in that continent, life is really miserable for them. And they're dying, they're already dying young. Does anybody have any question? we can't change the government, you know, we can't, really, as we know, we can't really do much. Is there an alternative way to take care of people? Because as I said, only 30% of Africans truly have access to health care anyway. So the other summit, they must be doing something. And because this is a continent, as you know, Africa has been, we've been for thousands and thousands of years, and they, and at least some Africans survived to today, and that's how I was born. So that means something, so, so there, there must be something that kept them going till today. So, and before Western medicine came to Africa, they were taking care of themselves. So, and, and that's where, and some places now, they begin to use both traditional medicine and Western medicine. And there are some universities in, in South Africa, I think in Ghana, and some Eastern Africans, they are there now teaching. They have been doctors like alternative medicine, that if, if you go to the hospital, if people really want the traditional medicine, then you know, they have the choice. Or sometimes you can use both. But the problem with traditional medicine is still in the very early stage that it needs to, a lot of research still needs to be done to see the efficacy, to see how effective most of these things are. But I believe that traditional medicine do work. Because if it didn't work, how did, did all of those people survive all those centuries? And most of the things that we use today, most of the medication we use today that the pharmaceutical companies are now multi-billion dollar company, they, are, they come from natural herbs. But now they've, they, they've made it into synthetic things because they want to multiply it in millions and millions. And now we're we are hooked on most of those drugs. We're hooked on most of those drugs and most of us are addicted to it. We don't even realize how addicted we are to most of those drugs. But they come from natural herbs. And, and but things that comes from natural art because we don't have enough of it, it's you know, it's good that they have to be able to multiply that. But it has its bad, you know, good and, and bad side. So they do have um, places that they begin to train uh, people to on, on traditional medicine. And maybe that may be the you know, that's the way to solve half of the problems in um, in Africa in the next decade. That when you have places like that, even if you can't afford um, Western medicine the traditional medicine will be cheaper and affordable and something that they're comfortable with. Because most Africans are not, they don't trust Western medicine. And that's one of the problems that you have with um, Ebola. When, when they begin to see them talking about Ebola and talking about Ebola, suddenly they have these people in white masks covering their face as if they were coming from space. And people were like looking at them that, who are those people? They said, oh, because of the disease and the, and people said, no, you're, you're not, you can't come near me. What is all that? And suddenly everybody was running away from them. And, and they put people in the hospital. People ran out of the hospital. People with Ebola ran out of the hospital, fighting the doctors and like, they said, no, that I don't want to do, why, why are they putting that mask on? They look so stupid. So at the end of the day, they don't trust. that like someone's never been to the hospital and suddenly you admit the person in the hospital and then you're putting that white paint. 
They just like look at you and say, is this a joke or what? And that's what happened to most people, that they don't realize the severity of, of what was going on with them. They went back to their homes and spread the disease. And that's why you have the, a very high rate of death in, in those places. But now, you know, the education, you know, people know what it means. But they didn't know it because they don't trust. four kids. Before, in Africa, it's not unusual you have six, seven, eight kids. In my family, my husband's family, my, 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 uh, my husband has um, 26 nephews and nieces, and she has four siblings. My sister-in-law, after my husband, she has eight children. It's no big deal. In Africa, if you start having babies, um, you have a girl and a girl and a girl, you may end up with 10. Because until you have a boy, you still don't have a child. That's the African tradition. So it's not unusual, even till today, it's not unusual for Africans to have four, five, six kids. So now, maybe one or two will die, or maybe none will die. Okay, if you have six and two dies, you still have four. In, in, in the Western world, most people don't have kids anymore. An average person, a well-educated person, will have one child, maybe two. It's very unusual to see Americans having four or five kids. People are like, what's wrong with that? You know. So even in Europe now, people don't have children anymore. And people don't get married anymore. So in that in other part of the world, the, the childbirth is really reducing. But in Africa, they still have that traditional uh, uh, practice. They will still continue having children. And because they're having children, so even though they still they have the children, but they may still, before, maybe they'll die at 30, but now they're dying at 40 and now 50. So the life expectancy is increasing, but the, the rate of the number of people dying is still not meeting the numbers of people being born. So there truly lots of people being born, and there's still people dying, but it's, you can't compare that. It's still, it's still doubling. Yeah. And because the rest of the country, the rest of the world is not really growing, that's the only part. And that's why they say Africa is where you have the most middle class uh, people in the world in the next 20, 30 years. Because in most of the Western world, they've really got to that end. And you see in, in, in the United States, the middle class is moving you know, the other way now. So Africa is like the new middle class, you know, we we'll get to see in, in the world very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in regards to education and um, training of the healthcare workforce, um, would you say that there's any blaming, blaming colonization or the failure of training or putting in place these institutions? I mean, we're looking at 60 years independence in most countries in Africa, and if there weren't uh, institutions in place that had those Did everybody hear that? No, she said, because she said um, do, we th do I think um, colonization has an impact on not developing? As you know, colonization in Africa is one of the major problems. It's, 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 colonization in Africa is like slavery in the United States. It's deep, it's something that, you know, it has, it has an impact, like a major, major impact on the continent. Because the, the first wave of leaders that were put in all of those countries are leaders that were unpicked by the colonial masters. And because they were unpicked, the reason why they were unpicked, and I think um, Dr. Buba did mention, uh, um, so I think I, I, I just came in at that time. Because they were unpicked, 
They were still running the country for decades. They were running the country the way they want, even though Africans were there being leaders, but they were just puppets of the colonial masters. So with all of that, and the corruption you see today in most of the African countries, is something learned from the colonial masters. It's something they've learned from the colonial masters. So most of the things, most of the things you see that's happening in Africa is an impact of colonization. For example, most of the conflict you see in most African countries, these are people that they have nothing to do with each other. They truly have nothing to do with each other. They don't look the same. They have their, they're minding their own business. Then they came, and this person came that, that clueless, just see all these black people, and they say, okay, man, you from here, just cut. So they cut half of these people, they're the same, they cut them to that side, and they cut them to that side, and cut them and say, oh, yeah, this is um, Chad. Oh, yes, this is Nigeria. And they say, oh, no, 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 we're so, no, no, you are here. And then, yeah, this is this. And they cut, I see they're cutting um, slices of cakes. Everybody taking their own piece and created a country called Africa. And then we wonder why people can't live together. Even within a country, people can't live together. In Nigeria, Nigeria wants to separate, but they can't separate. Unfortunately, the oil that we have in Nigeria is a cost. I wish we didn't have oil. Maybe everybody would have gone their own separate ways and mind their own business, and everybody would be happy. We would be the best. Because then if the evil goes, they'll be doing their own thing. OK, you want to have your own country, be Afro time. Then the Yorubas will do their own, and then the, uh, the, the household. But no, now we have the oil. Everybody does, nobody wants to leave. Nobody will leave because of the oil. So the, the oil in, 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 in Nigeria is a cost, and it's a cost on the next generation of Nigerians. So my point is, yes, colonization has had a major impact on that continent. And some of the problems we see today, that's, that's, you know, that's the background. But at the end of the day, how, how long will Africans begin to give excuses? OK, you know, yeah. but can't we then wake up one day and say, you know, this is not the kind of life we need, and this is not the future we want for our own children, for the next generation? So we know that colonization, just like in, in the United States as well, you know, we know slavery has an impact on, on, on minorities in, in this country. We know the health disparity we see in the United States, you know, it, it, it has an history from the time of slavery. But we can't say because of that, giving that as an excuse and not moving forward. We need to move forward. Last question. She said, um, how did Nigeria, uh, how were they able to really respond to the Ebola, you know, because we had the person there and they were able to really um, control that, which was good, because it would be the greatest disaster if Ebola spreads in Nigeria, because we'll be talking, what's happening in Liberia or, or you know, or um, Sierra Leone or Guinea is going to be, it's going to be a child's play if Ebola was, if it wasn't controlled to go into Nigeria, especially in Lagos. In Lagos, people don't sleep. People, some people you don't even know if they have homes because 12 hours, 24 hours, people are just walking and walking and they say, where are they going? Where are they coming from? You know, millions of people in, in, in that small space. The reason is that um, I think they were able to rally people around and were able to control it because they are very, very good, uh, um, what's it called, um, NGOs. NGOs that were able, oh, is that telling me time to go? No, no. <laughs> Sorry. I think they had, you know, real good support of some NGOs. And in Nigeria, I won't lie to you, they are some very capable people in Nigeria. The problem with Nigeria is because you don't have the support. You don't have the support of good hospitals, you don't have the support of good school and everything. They are, they are more than capable people to do whatever we are doing here in the United States. So because they have, I think they have enough funding and support, which Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea don't have, they were able to quickly rally people around, they were able to send people out, mobilize people, and because of resources, everything in life is resources. If you don't have resources, you're done in anything in life. 
Either you're living in a community that doesn't have resources, you're done. If you're living in a country that doesn't have resources, you're done. It's all about resources. I think they were able to mobilize people, they had more than enough resources, and they were quickly, you know, and they were able to for, follow the protocol. And there, there are lots of people who are more than capable. And you know Ebola has happened in Africa, um, you know, um, so many years ago, and some of the people that dealt with it, I think some of the researchers are from Nigeria and things like that. So they were on top of it, and they were able to deal with that. Yeah, so which was good, because it would have been a major disaster if Nigeria wasn't able to really contain that. Because millions of people would, would may end up dying. So thank God for that. Next question, yeah. will people send doctors to help Africans? When Africans can be doctors, they can be nurses, they are smart enough to, I'm telling you, if you go to any, any um, teaching hospital in the United States, any hospital, just go to UPMC, go to Shadyside, I can, I can count 20 Nigerian doctors, cardiologists, neurosurgeons, everything. Why, you know, it, it, it can only help, this is just like a band-aid, you're just, you know, you have a problem, you put a bandaid and not cleaning the wound, eventually, you know, it's still to gangrene, and what's the point? It makes sense, to, you know, on a temporary measure, but it's not sustainable. Even in the United States, we don't have enough doctors. So the few people that can go, they will only go briefly and come back. So what will three months, four months do? I, I do appreciate that people really volunteer their time because they're really truly saving lives. But it's all about sustainability. How can you keep on going and keep on going and keep on going? They need to take care of themselves. So we have to find a way to make Africans stay and take care of themselves. I think that's the best way. That's the only sustainable way. We can help as much as we want. And the amount of money we put into that continent, that continent should be competing with the United States. No, not even the continent, the, the United States of country. Each of those countries needs to be competing with the United States, with the amount of money that's been put into that continent. So that is, it's not really working that they're planning. No, I think that the best thing to do in Africa is start teaching the next generation of Africans on what is called civil society. They should know what their rights are. And I think it's beginning to happen. Now that we are all connected, the whole world is connected, and average um, young African now, anywhere in the continent, they know, they know their rights. They should teach them how to, uh, um, in a democratic um, environment, how to vote how to vote people out, how to speak up, and, and, and you know, fight against the government and say this is not what we want, because that's the only way they can survive. Most of the things we've been doing is just band aid It's not sustainable, because if it's sustainable, Africa should have been better. Africa shouldn't have all these bad, you know, really negative um, indicators. There's something not right. And the reason is until we, we change, we change the, the mindset of the people in that continent and the change the mindset of our leaders that they are there to serve us. We are not there to serve them. An African leader in a democratic environment still thinks when, when they get there it's for their family. They, they forget that it's for the society. So most of the money they put is in their pocket because they assume it's for their family. They forget that it's not for their family. Even the oil Nigerians are fighting, the Igbos are fighting, the Alsos are fighting, the Yorubas are fighting. It's not it's nobody's oil. The oil doesn't belong to anybody. The, be the oil belongs to Nigerians, every single Nigerian. But this is the Nigerian mentality. When Nigeria has something, they think it belongs to their family. The Igbo states it belongs to them. Why would they belong to the Igbo? The land, the, the Nigerian land belongs to all Nigerians. <coughs> so why would the revenue, f because the, the revenue comes from it, one part of the, of, of the country, why, do, why, why does it belong to you? 
and until we, we begin to change minds of people that that kind of thinking doesn't go with development. Yeah, so I do understand what you mean, you say. We still have to continue sending people there, at least to save people for not dying today. But how long will we continue sitting, doing that? It's not sustainable. That's the bottom line, sustainability. How long can we continue doing that? And then, especially when they're going to be two billion. How many American doctors will take care of two billion people? Oh, we're praying that we have enough doctors to take care of us in the next 10 years. Because going to medicine now, we begin to see that you know, not lots of people are going to medicine even in the United States and you know, as before. Does anybody have any other questions? I think I'm done. <laughs>